Good morning. It is Friday, June 18th, about 10.30 in the morning here in Zhongshan, China. Uh, I just want a short live stream with you guys um, because uh, I've been so busy this week and next week I've got a lot of things going on. So I just wanted to check in with all of you and tell you what's going on and uh, give you some updates on my life and what I'm doing uh, in the future with the vlog. Uh, I don't know what time it is. What time is it in America? Like 10.30 on the East Coast, maybe 7.30? PM on the West Coast. Um, most of my audience seems to be from America, at least. Uh, okay, so uh, last time we checked in with you, we were doing testing throughout uh, Zhongshan. Uh, the entire city was checked within just a few days. Uh, I was told over 5 million tests were completed, and there were zero positive uh, outcome. So that's great news. Uh, and Zhongshan wasn't the only city that did this. Most cities in the Pro River Delta, I think all of them did it, really. Uh, the situation in Guangzhou seems to be getting better, I guess. Um, I, 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 I know that they've dropped a, a couple of the, of the uh, restrictions in the Liwan district in Guangzhou, but they still find like one or two a day, I guess. I think yesterday there was zero, but um, you now the, the situation is just kind of the same <laughs> there. And the same here in Zhongshan. Everyone's still very much on high alert. Um, there have been no reported cases here. Uh, travel restrictions are in place. They say basically, look, if you don't need to travel, don't travel. Uh, the, uh, the gyms are still open. Uh, the entertainment facilities are still open, bars, restaurants, everything's still open. Uh, the only thing that are closed, the schools are still open, but the only thing that are closed are the training centers. But there might be other reasons for the training centers being closed. And uh, I'll get into that when we go into the news a little bit later. Uh, I spent the weekend out in Huizhou, uh, the holiday weekend. The, um, just drove out there, spent some time with Mono. We went to the beach and... Uh, uh, I've been to the beach many times in, in China, but this is one of the nicer beaches I think I've been to uh, in Huizhou. It's the first time I've been to the beach in Huizhou. I have some photos. Let me show you some photos. Um, let's see here. Where are we? Okay, let's see. Let's start with this one here. So this is um, a very interesting, I took video, of course, of it. But as you can see, there's um, a pretty clean beach. Uh, some boats, you can go for a boat ride. They have some jet skis you can rent. Uh, later on, there's a couple of Hobie cats down the beach, but uh, they weren't rigged, so I wasn't able to actually go for a ride. I really wanted to. This uh, hotel you see here, this um, is the Country Garden Phoenix Hotel. I think that's what it's called. It is a an older property, and it's showing its age. It really is. The boardwalk here is actually pretty nice lots of really decent restaurants and uh, a couple of bars a couple of bars like right on the beach so you can get like a beer or an ice cream or something which is nice and um, uh, lots and lots of families out uh, further on down the beach a little bit uh, where less people you know you can pretty much have the whole place to yourself and then there are some tide pool coves that you can go and explore just a lovely afternoon at the beach in Huizhou. Um, these are the Hobie cats that uh, they're, you know, they're, they're in very good condition, but they just weren't rigged uh, for sailing. And I was really upset about it because I, I thought that uh, renting a Hobie, that was a perfect day for sailing. It really was. It was a good, strong wind, a small chop out um, it, for a beach launch would have been very, very simple. Um, uh, I was uh, kind of bummed about about it. So I hope to go back here sometime this summer, since I have a lot of time this summer. hope to go back this summer and try to get out on the Hobies. It's been so long since I've been sailing, you know, too long, really. And, of course, uh, we also went for a little bike ride. Um, I can't remember the name of the lake, something like uh, Red Red Flower Lake or uh, no, I can't remember it. It's in the city of Huizhou, right next to It's connected to the West Lake. And uh, we had a good time I'm playing with my new camera, the Insta360 camera there. Uh, and I bought a new toy. Well, I didn't buy it. This was um, this belongs to my colleague, and he's letting he's going to let me use it. So uh, I hope to do because I can't run anymore. So um, I hope to do some um, mountain biking in the mountains here. And uh, took it into the bike shop, had it uh, kind of 
tuned up a little bit, cleaned up a little bit, bought, bought a couple of accessories and hoping to hit the trails this summer. Uh, there might be a larger adventure in store for us for mountain biking in the near future. I'm really excited for that. Yesterday I was filming um, at a Dongpong dealership here in Zhongshan. I was filming the 580 Pro, which is, you know, it's, it's a it's a it's a car that is exported throughout the world, but it's wasn't a great car, I have to admit. And you'll see that in the video. And I'm I'm testing out my new cameras and everything. But then I saw this one in the corner. If you don't know, this is the series uh, SF5, uh, otherwise known in marketing terms as the Huawei car. Uh, and when I was, I'm going to be filming this in the next few weeks. By the way, I think Monday. I'm going to get a chance to film this. I have access, uh, know a guy who actually owns one. He's going to let me film it on Monday morning. And I'm excited for this. Now, the, the, when you read about this, you look at the news and everything, it says, oh, that's the Huawei car. Huawei developed a car. Huawei's building cars now. And that's not really the case. It's, it's, kind, of, um, it's kind of a misnomer. Huawei is making um, parts for the car industry now. The brains inside this, the, the software, and even a little bit of the hardware is from Huawei. Huawei does have a history of hardware, but this is essentially a Series SF5, which was debuted in 2019. Uh, and it's developed by, I think it's Chongqing Sokon Industrial Company or something along those lines. Um, and uh, in America, it's known as SF Motors, which is a subsidiary of this Chinese company out of Chongqing. It's an all elect. It's not an all electric vehicle. I, I think this one has a range extender. I could be wrong on that. Some of my research was said one thing and another, but they are selling this at Huawei stores. It'd be like the same as going into an Apple store and buying an Apple car. They're trying to sell this car as a Huawei car, but it really isn't. What it is is Huawei inside. I think that's more of an a more accurate way of talking about it because this technology and a lot of these parts are being. Um, collaborated with other Chinese manufacturers, not just Sirius, but also uh, the Arc Fox by the bike group. Guangzhou Automotive is in on it. Chang'an is also in on it. So you're going to see a lot of Huawei inside. What Huawei doesn't want to build cars. There's a lot of hype going around saying, oh, it's the Huawei's building cars now. They're not. They don't want to build cars, according to their CEO. What they want to do is be a parts supplier to the auto industry. So rather than having one... Um, one car that they sell, they're going to sell parts to all the Chinese brands. So that's what this is. And I'll be filming it on Monday. And uh, yeah. Okay. Let's do some news. Again, this is not going to be a long live stream. I just wanted to check in with you all and say hi. Uh, two bedroom, 90 square meters, returning to simplicity and simplicity, creating a very warm and comfortable home. I like this one. It's not a big apartment, but it's got like a, you can see from the floor plan, it's kind of got a, a it's, it's a long, narrow kind of floor plan. It kind of goes up. But what really uh, stood out for me was the bathroom in this one. So um, I'll show you what I mean here. This kind of tree, you know, indoor garden kind of thing is a common thing I'm starting to, uh, I see a lot in, and uh, Chinese homes now. It's usually used for storage, but now it's becoming like this, this uh, artistic meditation area in homes, I guess. <laughs> I like it. I dig it. It's something other than storage. If you got the space, it's fine. Where is it? Let me go down to the bathroom. So the bathroom design is really cool. I love the mirror, but um, what gets me is, um, or the bedroom design, is this tub here on the balcony. And if you can see, it looks right into the neighbor's yard. So I never understood tubs like this. Why do they have tubs like this uh, on the balcony? I know if you've got, you know, un uninterrupted views of a cityscape or a mountainscape where no one's going to look in, that's great. I can dig that. But this one simply looks into the neighbor's yard. I mean, the neighbors can just see you taking a bath. I don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> you can explain that one to me. Hmm. Oh, they have a children's room in this one. Okay, kind of a Japanese style. Look at this old TV set. Very cool. All right. I kind of dig that. 
I didn't even see that before. This kind of Jackson Pollock esque painting. It, it would be good if it wasn't so busy. Okay. All right, let's get to the news because there's there are some things we can talk about here. So the first one. China to unveil tough new rules for private tutoring sector. This has been all over the news lately. Uh, the Department of Education is going to like branch off a new authority for dealing with private tutoring and after school education in China. This has uh, been a huge blow to um, the private uh, training center tutoring market. And uh, it's, I mean, this, this industry has already gotten hit so heavily in the last year because of COVID and all the lockdowns, it was just starting to recover. If you don't know, it's not just English education. It's all kinds of tutoring. It's math tutoring. It's music tutoring. It's it's uh, sports training centers. All of these things that are these after-school weekend programs for you know everything from kindergartens to high schoolers. And it's huge business in China. I mean, huge. I mean, the majority of English teachers in China are employed in this in this field. Uh, and a, a majority of foreigners in China are employed in this field. Um, but I'm talking billions of dollars. So what's happening is the Chinese government is is worried about children um, working too hard, being too stressed at school. You know, they already have a full load at school with with homework and testing. And then on the weekends, their parents make them go to uh, these training centers. Hold on. So so uh, they're constantly working and they don't have any time to relax. And I get it. I see it. I've seen it personally in, in some of my students in the past. So they are announcing that there's going to be a huge new crackdown on um, training centers who are overcharging for tuition, who are overpromising in their marketing, um, who are uh, doing unfair labor practices, all of these kinds of things. Uh, that should be coming, but the rumor is is that they're going to take the summer off. It's going to be like a, a summer vacation of training centers, and they're not going to allow the training centers to open for the summer so that the kids can have the summer off. Whether or not that happens, we don't know. Here in Zhongshan, the training centers are closed. Uh, we were told that that was for the COVID uh, issue, so to stop the spread of COVID, fine. I'm, I'm understanding of that, but this might be a regular thing. Uh, going forward. They're talking about the training centers being not only closed on the weekends or at very limited hours on the weekends, but also uh, during the week, very limited hours during the week. Now, this is going to be a huge problem. And this also goes for online tutoring as well. But this is going to be a huge problem for the industry because 70, 80 percent of the classes for these training centers are taught on the weekends. I mean, that's all of these trainers whether it be language or mathematics or art or sports, almost all of them work on the weekends because that's when, I mean, during the week, the kids are in school. So this is going to be an unknown blow to the industry if it goes through. But let's read a little bit. So it's, um, China is poised to unveil a much tougher and anticipated crackdown on the country's $120 billion private tutoring industry, including trial bans on vacation tutoring and restrictions on advertising. The new rules which aim both to ease pressure on school children and boost the country's birth rate by lowering family living costs could be announced as early as next week and take effect next month. The imposition of the trial ban on both online and offline tutoring over the summer and winter holidays in Beijing, Shanghai, and other major cities goes much further than the planned measures first reported by Reuters last month. The new rules would be stricter than expected, one said or said one of the sources, a person close to the regulators drafting the new rules, the industry should be preparing for the worst. Mm. The trial vacation ban, which adds to plans to bar online and offline tutoring on weekends during term time, could deprive tutoring companies as much as 70, 80% of their annual revenue. Wow. The changes could be, the changes being drafted by the Ministry of Education and other authorities target the cutthroat tutoring market for school students from kindergarten through the 12th grade or K through 12 pupils, an industry that has grown rapidly in recent years. More than 75% of K through 12 students, roughly age 6 to 18, in China attended after school tutoring classes in 2016, according to the most recent figures from the Chinese Society of Education. And anecdotal evidence suggests the percentage has risen. 
The planned industry crackdown had already forced at least one major company providing tour services to put a billion dollar fundraising round on ice is being driven from the top. So this is what's going on. We'll find out in the next week or so, but that's um, telling us to be prepared for the worst. I'm a little more optimistic. Maybe, maybe I should be, maybe I'm not, but uh, you know, I have many, many, I started my career in China in the private tutoring industry. I have many, many friends who work in this industry and rely on this industry for their jobs. And uh, this might be an end to, to that. So um, watch it, watch it carefully. I'll give you more information as it comes out in the future. By the way, um, if, if indeed it does happen, there will be other workarounds. I mean, these with demand being sky high for this stuff and them restricting supply like this, the, the market will have to find equilibrium. That's just the way it is. And how that happens, nobody really knows yet. So we'll find out. Have you heard about this? We talked about this uh, in the past. It's been all over the news, these, these wandering elephants in Yunnan province. Uh, I, I find them fascinating. I mean, it's, it's, it's just a small little herd of elephants that is on the outskirts of Kunming. And whether or not they, you know, they uh, enter in, they've already caused tons of damage and they're trying to steer them away. They've been successful in some cases, but in other cases they haven't been, but they're trying to guide these wandering elephants home. <clears throat> Experts say the climate environment may not be suitable for the animals as they head further north. For months, a herd of endangered Asian elephants has been a long journey without final destination in the southwestern province of Yunnan. Now, conservationists and local authorities are trying to guide them home. They've been doing this with like caissons and, you know, trying to put food on the road and trying to lure them certain directions and everything away from the cities. Um, but it's been a fascinating story over the last few weeks watching, you know, these elephants roam through some of the smaller towns on the outskirts of Kunming. It's really interesting uh, how this is all going down. Pay attention to this. We'll talk about more of it in the future. Um, that's a, that's um, this uh, Sichuang Bana Dai Autonomous Prefecture, you know, the country's border of Laos and Myanmar. <clears throat> that's the nature preserve that these guys are from. I have a buddy of mine who's actually been there and seen it and says it's really beautiful. But because of this story, there's been a lot more interest in this. Um, in this nature preserve on the southern part of Yunnan. Most people go north into Dali and Lijiang and Shangri-La, right? But uh, they're saying that more and more people are wanting to book tours of this area of southern Yunnan as a result of, of uh, this story. More to come on that. Here's an interesting story I found was rather unique. Man sues insurance provider over love insurance claim. I didn't even know this was a thing. I guess you can insure anything. Love insurance. Okay. So this has been in the news lately. When you read it, you're going to see it, it. It's kind of, it's kind of sad, really. A man in central China's Henan province reportedly sued a local insurance company that denied to pay him out his love insurance he purchased years before. The man surnamed Shu bought three years of love insurance in November of 2016. The insurance regulated that if Shu could preserve the marriage with his wife for at least three years, Shu could receive some 23,000 yuan or about $3,600 from the insurance company when the insurance expired in November 2019. But Shu didn't receive the payment after the insurance expired. He then prosecuted the company after it failed to communicate with him. The insurance company said in court that Shu's marriage had ended, arguing that Shu and his wife had been to court for divorce proceedings in 2018. But staffers from the local marriage registration office said the couple didn't appeal after the court refused to allow them to divorce that year. As such, Shu was still married to his wife. The court later ruled that the insurance company should pay out Shu's claim. Shu spent nearly 20,000 yuan on the insurance. Showed a photo of his insurance. insurance. So he, he spent 20,000 yuan on the insurance. First emerging in the Chinese market around 2015, the eye-grabbing love insurance once attracted some 20-something clients with a public with a publicity stunt that said customers could get paid if the relationship or marriage with the same person lasts longer than three years. So it's a 20,000 RMB insurance policy, and you get back after three years 23,000. That doesn't seem like a very good return to me. 
Love insurance payments varied at different insurance providers, but included included money, diamonds, jewelry, and more romantic items such as 10,000 roses. Despite it becoming a trending gift during Valentine's Day in 2016, the product gradually withdrew from the Chinese market in the following two years after the China Insurance Regulatory Commission banned insurance companies from providing products with insurance events causing no actual harm to the insured in 2017. Interesting choice of words. <laughs> By the way, so this was in Hubei, uh, <coughs> Hubei province. Just so you guys know, I'll be going to uh, Hubei province Hub, not, Hubei, I'm sorry, not, it's not, I'm sorry, it's not Hubei, Henan, uh, Henan province. I'll be going to Zhengzhou next week. Uh, I've been uh, invited, uh, I'm going there for a couple of reasons. Um, it's an area of China I've always wanted to go to the Shaolin Temple, of course, and, and the Song Mountain. I'll be staying for a few days, and while I'm there, I'm going to be going to a massive bus factory. I'm going to be getting a tour of a massive bus factory, the Yutong bus factory. I am really excited about this. Um, if you don't know, I mean, most of the buses here in southern China are BYD, uh, the electric buses here. But uh, a lot of the long distance coaches and stuff are Yutong. And I've ridden on these buses. They're everywhere. And uh, it's a gigantic company with a lot of history. And uh, they've got some interesting things coming out. They have a museum up there too, but the museum I was told was not open. <clears throat> but I have secured, excuse me, <clears throat> frog in my throat. I have secured a tour of their factory. Uh, and I'm going to spend a day just roaming around and learning how these big coaches and buses and, and some of the new autonomous buses that they've got coming out. I'm going to get to ride on a couple of them. I'm really excited for that. So I'll be spending a day there, and then the rest of the time I'm there, I'm going to be at Mount Song. I'm going to be checking out uh, Zhengzhou, the city on the Yellow River, and uh, just exploring it a little bit. And I'm really excited. So I leave next week for that. So those videos will be coming out soon. So just a little preview of things to come. All right, back to the news. China fantasizes about a low desire life. Um, I talked about this in some of my other vlogs when I go to villages and uh, I support this actually. You know, the trend in China is that young people move to the cities to work and to make money and they live in high rise apartments and they live a very urbanized life. I foresee that changing very, very rapidly, especially with the younger generation who have grown up in these towers and these gardens and city life and urban life and kind of fantasize about, you know, or romanticize the village life. Even my students nowadays, I, I you know, if I, if I ask them, what do you want to do? And I, you know, kind of give them a couple of ideas and I come up farming. And a lot of them are attracted to the idea of farming. Obviously, no money in it unless you grow certain crops. But uh, the, the, the slower pace of life is uh, quite attractive to the younger generation, it seems. So in the new village revitalization plans that they have here, we've seen it firsthand. You've seen it in my channel. Um, going to some of these areas where they're revamping the villages with um, new infrastructure, um, beautifying the areas. Uh, more and more young people and families are moving back to the villages especially as you can work remotely these days. It's more common to do that. So I am I see that as a trend just on the cusp of starting. You know, the, the trend is still massive amounts of people going to the cities to find work. I mean, they, they still have to move another 100 million people into the cities in the next 10 years, I think it is. But you're going to see that that start to slow down quite a bit. And you're, I think you're going to see a slow migration out back out to the villages uh, and filling it in. Because when I go to the villages, it's quieter. It's p more peaceful. It's, uh, you know, maybe I'm just at the age where living in a city is just, you know, I, I like living in my city. You know, it's very convenient and wonderful and great energy. But there are weekends where I just want to relax and go to the mountains. You know, maybe I'm just at that age. But I start to, see, I'm going to, I think you're going to see a lot more Families start to do this as well. Embrace a slower life. Nine places that should be on your China bucket list. Okay, we've done this many times. Obviously, this is Jiangjiajie. 
Okay, we have uh, uh, Xinjiang. Um, there's been a lot of talk lately about going to Xinjiang for this summer, a little adventure. I'd love to do it. Uh, lots of things to see. It's so big there, you know. Um, I have been to Zhangjiajie and Fengguan. I don't want to go there for the summer. I want to go there in the winter. I want to see uh, Zhangjiajie in the winter time. So uh, maybe next spring festival. Um, yoga and mindfulness retreats. This is another trend that I see growing very rapidly in China are these yoga and mindfulness retreats. Um, groups of people going out to beautiful areas, countryside. You have hotels in these countrysides that are catering to these groups for doing yoga. Yoga is exploding in China, has been for many years, but more and more people. I've been doing yoga for 12 years. I mean, I, I love it. I really do. But especially for men, it's not really a thing in China. It's mostly for women. But more and more men are starting to see the, the health benefits of this. So you're starting to see a lot of these groups and these these travel programs going to places like Guilin. And this one, I think, is in Anhui. Uh, uh, Anji, Anji, Mount, the Anji Mountains. Okay. So there you go. Another trend that is increasing very, very quickly. Okay. Yoga and mindful mindfulness retreats. Now, I've never done one of these things. I mean, I love going hiking and swimming and you know, I, I love doing yoga, but and I have done yoga out in these like places, you know, these beautiful areas, you know, just on my own. But I've never gone with one of these like retreats. It might be an interesting tour, meet some like-minded people. Here's the thing about Xinjiang. Xinjiang, the natural beauty there. I mean, you have mountains and rivers. You have deserts. You have so many different types. So big. You have so many different types of landscapes. Inner Mongolia. Now I've been to Mongolia, but um, that's very green. <laughs> Yeah, staying in a yurt down with that. Uh, Guizhou. Now, Guizhou is a place that I am planning on visiting this summer. We are planning a um, pretty substantial little road trip to Guizhou. Uh, go through maybe uh, western Hunan, uh, maybe drive up through Guilin and into Guizhou. There's so much to see in Guizhou. It's considered one of the more poor provinces in China, but they've invested a lot in their infrastructure. They have good roads. They have good buses, trains. They have excellent um, hospitality infrastructure there. We're talking restaurants and scenic spots and things like this. And it's all fairly new. I mean, so it, it's the next place, I guess, for especially in southern China, to explore. And it's relatively inexpensive. Uh, so like five-star hotels there are... Not quite half, but they're they're heavily discounted compared to the Guangdong. So you can you can go there and go camping and see the natural beauty, and you can live a luxurious lifestyle for a vacation in Guizhou. And there's lots of things to see and do in Guizhou. So more more places to go and see. Motorbiking. Is this Tibet? Oh, this is Yunnan. Uh, love to do it. So many things to do, and no money. <laughs> <laughs> Ten Cent Studio calls halt to 996 working hours. If you don't know, I've done this on Rojo Reason News. The 996 uh, culture is uh, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. six days a week with one day off. It's an unofficial kind of work culture in the tech industry in China. There's been a lot of backlash towards it uh, for the health of young workers. Uh, Tencent is trying to go away from this, I guess, but we'll see if it catches on, you know, the happy work, healthy life. I hope it does. Mexican food, Miss Chipotle, the restaurant, this restaurant is opening in Shenzhen. It's not Chipotle though. Uh, three friends, Ellie, Ruby and Lee, or Lei, excuse me, had always dreamed of opening their own spin on the fast casual Americans restaurant here in Shenzhen. A few months ago, they walked past a rental sign for a vacant shop and thought, this is the perfect place. Let's do it. The restaurant is called Fundamental, officially opened this weekend in, on Saturday, June 12th. So those sticking around the city for the holidays, here's something new to check out. 
The shop name fundamental refers back to the basics of food and letting the ingredients do the talking. We popped in for the soft opening on Wednesday. Sneak peek. Look at this. Burritos. Mm. Oh, God. I'm, I'm starting to miss Mexican food now, guys. Here we go. Okay. So they have quesadillas, nachos, El Rojo. <laughs> they have the El Rojo. I guess that's a... Oh, you can get a burrito bowl, taco, salad. Okay, so those are, it's just like uh, Chipotle. So El Blanco, El Roto, is it Rosado, El Rojo, and El Verde. Okay. So the B58 Remen beef for beef burrito, is that right? Uh, tacos. Uh, what? Chimichangas, fajitas. Um, Corona beer, of course. Okay, Qingdao, Budweiser with extra. Very simple. Looks like a whiskey Coke, rum and Coke. And they have a tequila sunrise. So a very simple little menu, but I like simplicity. So this looks pretty good, you know? Mexican food is exploding in China. It's really starting in Shenzhen. There's a lot of good Mexican restaurants in Shenzhen. There's a couple in Guangzhou. But I've noticed a couple of restaurants here, especially after, you know, um, uh, Cinco de Mayo uh, have kept their Mexican items on the menu and uh, tacos are popping up taco you know at, at Chinese restaurants I'm seeing tacos pop up, pop up everywhere um, quesadillas are a constant thing on the menu everywhere those are very easy to come by I and mean, they're easy to make um, but tacos fajitas um, I still haven't seen burritos on any of the menus here but I don't think it'll take long for Mexican food to to catch on. I mean, it, it it's really good. <laughs> a little too much cream on those nachos, but not too bad. Okay. All right, last one. Okay, nope, I think we're done. Yep. So that's it for today. I just wanted to stop in and say hi to everybody and give you an update about what I am doing. Again, next week I'll be in Hunan province. Uh, filming the uh, Yutong Bus Factory. It's this gigantic bus company, and they got a lot of interesting things. I've been doing a lot of research on them lately. Um, they're going into autonomous driving buses and things like this, but they also make these giant coach, you know, sleeper buses and city buses, all kinds of different things. And they also make other commercial vehicles. So I'm very excited for Ever Chance. It'll be my first automotive factory tour. I've done other factory tours in China, of course, but this will be my first automotive factory tour and my first factory tour on this scale. And I'm excited to bring that to you. While I'm out there, I'm going to go to Mount Song and a couple of other places. Coming up, uh, vlogs that I'm currently working on. I've got a lot. I've got my weekend in Huizhou where we just went for a little bike ride. That'll be a simple little vlog. Uh, car videos. I've got the geometry uh, A. I think it's called the Jihu. So the Geometry A Pro, which is their updated one, uh, that I went for a drive. I filmed it. It's loaded right now. I'm actually editing it right now. I did the Dongfeng 580 Pro, which is an SUV. Now, this one will be more about the company of Dongfeng itself and the history of Dongfeng kind of around that vehicle. Um, if, in doing the research for Dongfeng, it really sent me down a rabbit hole because there's so many connections. That company is so outrageously large and confusing with all kinds of joint ventures and subsidiaries and partnerships. It's amazing how many tentacles that company has throughout the industry. Uh, I, I tried to make sense of it a little bit in the video. Monday, I'll be filming the series, the so-called Huawei car again. Um, I'm excited to bring that to you, I'm doing that on Monday. And a couple of other projects that are in the works, including one very large infrastructure project here uh, between Zhongshan and Shenzhen, if you know what I'm talking about. I hope I'll have access to that sometime in the very near future because it is a massive project and it's in my backyard. So I want to bring that to you as well. And some other, you know, playing with my new mountain bike toy and my new camera toy. Uh, Joe says you can... Joe says, um, you can try the fundamental restaurant in downtown LA when you come back. It's high quality sandwiches and burgers, et cetera. Not quite Mexican, but it's pretty good. 
I would love to. I can't wait to come back to LA, dude. I cannot wait to come back to LA. <laughs> um, I miss good burgers. We have good burgers here. I mean, oh, Hamburger Hunt. There's another video. I again, I just need one more. Actually, there's two. Uh, this afternoon, I'll be going to a brand new hamburger restaurant in my neighborhood, right to maybe two blocks from here. I'm gonna be walking there. I'll be filming that. And then I have one other one that I need to get to. Last time I went into that restaurant, it was closed. And I was like, damn, that's terrible. So uh, two, two more to finish my hamburger hunt part two. <laughs> ah. uh, greetings from Shenzhen. How is uh, Zhongshan now? I heard it's on lockdown. Uh, no, that's not correct. It's the Zhongshan has not been on lockdown at all. Uh, you still have to show your health code, wear a mask when you go public places, but nothing is the only thing that's closed is the training centers. There is no lockdown in Zhongshan. You're free to come and go to the gyms, the movie theaters, the restaurants, the bars. Uh, all entertainment facilities are open. Everything is just fine here. They tested the whole city and uh, came up with zero, but everyone's still on there um, on edge. In Guangzhou, it's a different story. Like, I, I don't go to Guangzhou. If I went to Guangzhou, it would change my health code. So I stay away from Guangzhou. Most people are. So uh, yeah, keep that off your green code. <laughs> okay, I got to run, guys, because hey, guess what? It's almost lunchtime, and I've got to go get me a burger. So I hope all is safe and happy. Just a quick check-in with you guys, and we'll see you in upcoming vlogs. Take care.